Thank you, Anna. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming along um, this evening. And uh, yeah, hopefully we've got a, a really good evening of, of expertise from Rini. Um, and thank you, Rini, for coming along and um, giving up your evening. Um, it's really great to have you here. And Rini and I are friends. We run together. We discuss world problems together. We, we do all sorts of, um, yeah, we've, we've done some work together as well. So it's really great to have Rini along. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. And I'm going to say to everybody, they should buy your book because I would be <laughs> lucky to get a pre pre copy and it is brilliant. And I love, I mean, I, you know, I love Jenna, Jenna Sim anyway, because they're, they're good friends of mine, but reading about that year, I don't think you can really talk about it in the same way as you can when you write about it. So I think, you know, it's, it's a really brilliant book and I'm not just saying that because you're in front of me, I'm going to buy it for a lot of people. So um, yeah, everybody should go out and buy that book. Thank you. Thank you. And we've now I've gate crashed your your talk far too much now. <laughs> so about Rini, um, just a, a quick overview because we'll talk about about lots of this later on. But Rini is a leading sports and eating disorder specialist dietitian. She's got many years of experience, um, both in the NHS and then more recently privately. She has worked with athletes um, supporting the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, she is nutritionally the English National Ballet, Scottish Ballet, Ultra X. Uh, she works with lots of brands um, and the GB 24-hour uh, team. Um, and she's the best-selling author of Training Food, The Fast Fuel Books and Orthorexia and has a new book coming out, which I've been lucky enough to um, be a technical reader on. So we'll be talking about that later. Um, but yeah, so I thought it would be really good because Sports nutrition is um, kind of everywhere at the moment and everyone's an expert. And whenever you, you go on Instagram and everyone's offering advice on what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat. I think it'd be really good to start with kind of what, what is a dietitian? Because we see all these different different terms, nutritionist, dietitian, and all these. Um, and as far as I understand it, dietitian is a protected term. Is that a protected title? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So I thought it'd be really good just to go through what is a dietitian? Who should we be listening to in all this kind of noise around sports nutrition and things? Um, and also your journey to becoming a dietitian would be great. Okay, cool. So yeah, as we said, Jen, diet, a dietitian is a protected title. So fundamentally what that means is that the minimum level to actually become a dietitian is, is a degree level. Um, but actually in most cases, people do a degree and then a master's or a degree and a postgrad to become a registered dietitian. It also means you are protected by the Health Professions Council. So you have to work by a strict code of conduct. Um, and if you don't, then you do potentially have the risk of losing your license, a bit like medical, a bit like, a, you know, like medicine. Um, so you can get struck off. So basically what you put out there and what you actually um, using your practice has to be evidence-based and has to have kind of proper scientific backing you can't just make it up as you go along um so I guess from my point of view a dietitian is is probably the safe person to follow in the sense that you can't just call yourself a dietitian you do have to go and get that title um sadly although there are some very 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 good nutritionists out there it's not a protected title so anybody can call themselves a nutritionist you know like to be fair, like people here could listen to me and think they've got enough information on sports nutrition and can call themselves a nutritionist because it's not protected. So um, that's the difference. The other big difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian is that dietitians tend to go and get a lot of clinical training. So we are technically the only nutritional practitioner in the UK that can work in clinical conditions. So, you know, whether that's Things like diabetes, um, inflammatory bowel disease, oncology, eating disorders, pediatrics, etc. So, you basically get quite a, you do get a medical training to a certain degree within reason, um, but from a diet, from a nutrition point of view. Whereas again, a nutritionist, if they do have a degree level, it tends to be much more theoretical um, and scientific rather than actual hands-on practical and clinical. So. They're the kind of big differences, I suppose. But I say, I suppose it's really the big that's the bit that's really tricky is that so many people call themselves nutritionists and you don't really know if they've got a degree level. And I guess that's what I'd be looking at is if you are working with nutritionists, is just checking if they've got a degree level um, or not, and and then deciding if that's the person that you want to work with or not. Cool, thank you. Um, and how about um, like obviously you've gone kind of down the the sports route yeah um, what kind of drew you into that 
that area specifically, do you think? So really, really, I mean, I always think, I want to try and wonder why did I end up as a dietitian? Because um, it wasn't really where I was going. When I was at school, I loved, I did really like writing, believe it or not. Um, and I liked English and I really liked biology. But I came from, or I, I still do, I still come from um, an Indian background. And my, you know, it's kind of quite stereotypical. My parents were very stereotypical in that, you know, academ academia was really important and they wanted me to do something scientific. Um, and I was lucky that I was fairly good at science. Like I, it wasn't something that was difficult for me. I was fairly good at science. So I ended up doing biology, chemistry, maths, because I thought, well, it would open a lot of doors. And, and actually the route I was going into was biochemistry because I was really, really fascinated by how the body worked. Like that for me has always been my kind of real love is understanding what's going on internally with all these chemical processes that go on um, inside us. I think like Brian Cox said that humans are basically just a series of chemical reactions. And it's so true, like we, we are, and I think, I've always been fascinated by that. And so I actually went down the road of biochemistry first and that's where I um, started. So I did an undergrad in biochemistry, but then when you got to your sort of halfway through your degree, you then had to decide which, which area you were gonna go into with biochemistry. And I'd been interested in the sort of nutrition aspect in terms of we'd learned loads about you know, antioxidants and um, things like triglycerides and, and like, but how they really work at that cellular level. So not kind of just what they are and what they do, but how they actually work with at the cellular level. And I just found it fascinating. So I ended up doing a degree which specialised in nutritional biochemistry. Um, and that was at Nottingham. And as part of our final year, we had to um, go off and do like a dissertation like everybody else does has to but we had to sort of do it in an area of interest for us and my mentor at Nottingham he was he was really great and he said to me because I think you're really good at biochemistry and you're also getting great results but I do think you're much better with people than you are just being stuck in a lab and so I would really encourage you to think about a career that actually takes you out into a place where you can work with people and so he actually introduced me to a colleague of his who was a dietitian at the local um, hospital and I ended up doing a couple of weeks work experience there and then actually basing my dissertation on dietetics um, and that was kind of where it all started for me because then I was like oh okay this is quite interesting and I was like yeah I think I could do this and then I went to Glasgow straight after um, Nottingham and did my postgrad in dietetics where we did a year in um actually in uni and then you actually did a full year clinical placement where you're basically working on the job um, which was absolutely terrifying but really really good in the sense that you basically got to work in I mean I did my clinical placement at Geyser St Thomas's so you couldn't have got a better grounding in terms of what I was exposed to and what I got to see and I you know, I worked in everything from HIV to max facts to pediatrics to, to people to, you know, to kind of just general clinic as well, where people were coming in with allergies and issues with their weight or, or whatever. So you've got a really good grounding. Um, so I guess that's kind of where it all started. And I then was very, very lucky. I got a job straight away, um, again, working in a big teaching hospital in London. And a bit like medicine with dietetics, you you have to do loads and loads of rotation. So you don't just specialize, you have to kind of work your way up the ladder. And I started off doing everything. So I think I had like 14 wards to cover, which was a really good way of keeping fit because it was a massive hospital and I was literally running with my bleep from place to place. Um, it's also where I started running, believe it or not, as actually I did a little bit of running when I first got my first job because I couldn't really fit anything else into life, whereas running sort of fitted. So that was kind of where it started, but it didn't really take off at that point, but that's where it started. Um, and I basically worked my way up and over the course of like seven, seven years, got to the point where I was in like, I guess you'd sort of say you're at that specialist level. And I decided to specialize in pediatrics. And so I ended up working um, in this area of pediatrics, which again, you then specialize in again. And then finally, my end kind of point was, believe it or not, um, adolescent eating disorders, which I had had no intention of working in ever. But um, I found the kind of whole psychology, nutrition, 
clinical, like the medical, I found that the, those three sort of points of the triangle fascinating. And so that's where I sort of ended up. But this also coincided with me having two small children and I was pretty exhausted and found it harder and harder to work with with youngsters that were really really sick mentally and physically um and I think I just got to the point where I was like I don't think I can do this anymore I can't look after my kids and they were like 18 months and three and I can't look after my kids and do this I'm not really sure if I want to stay in the NHS either because I was really struggling with kind of the constraints of working in the NHS and not having the not having the space to practice as a practitioner like I wanted to because you only had 10 minutes or you know it was all postcode lo lottery sort of funded um, and so at that point I stepped away from the NHS and um, I've always been really sporty like always from from when I was a young kid I did swimming like from the age of five until I was 11 and then I went into dance and then I played hockey and netball. Like I've always been busy and active. Um, and by this point I was running with a running club and lots of people were asking me questions about nutrition and like, well, what, do you, what should I eat before my race? And how do you make sure you don't get an upset stomach when you're running on the track and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I know I can answer these questions, but me being me and wanting to always be actually you know credible and knowledgeable and everything I was like right I'm going to go off and do another degree so I went off at this point and completed an, a, 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 another postgrad in applied sports nutrition so that's kind of how I ended up in sports nutrition so it's a bit of a long-winded kind of journey but obviously I've stayed in that place um, but I've brought clinical aspects into my practice which I which I really like and I, I think there's there's not actually that many of us out there that that do the, the two across and uh, bridge that gap. So yeah, I think uh, that's kind of what I love about my job now is I've chosen two bits of it that I really enjoy and have brought it together. Brilliant, thank you. I, I always like knowing, like finding out how people got to where they are now because people do all these amazing jobs and actually like, like, it's never a straight line is it? It's kind of like, you kind of, and when you're at school and you go to your careers advisor and and they go, yeah, you're going to be this thing. And it never actually works out like that. So that's really cool. Thank you. Um, kind of on the, the practical side of things, I was I was wondering, like, in your opinion, um, um, what, like, we hear about a good diet and what, what a good diet should, good diet should be. Um, I was wondering kind of what, what you think the components of a good diet, a, a diet that supports kind of our daily life is and, and how, how that how we should um, maybe how that differs when we're talking about athletes, particularly athletes who are training a lot. Um, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, so I guess I mean the the components of a of a healthy diet, um, and I use that term again inverted commas, um, probably haven't really changed that much, even in the entire time that I, um, you know, first was a student and have gone all the way through. I mean, it is still very much, you know sort of basing your diet on complex carbohydrates and whole grains, which we know now have a real, an even more important place because they're so important for our gut biome, um, which again has, we've seen lots of big links with gut biome and our mental health, but also our immune health and our general physical health. And I think there's a lot more studies and work that needs to be done to kind of really clarify that, that uh, pathway. But we know that there are definite, very positive signs if you have a, have a, healthy gut biome so you know the, the complex carbohydrates the sort of big varieties of fruit and vegetables as many colors as you can possibly get it doesn't have to be I always say to people it doesn't have to be weird and wonderful fruits and vegetables but it just is the more different colors you can get the more likelihood you are going to get all the different nutrients and using frozen is equally just as good as using fresh so again you, you know I think one of the things we hear so much is that a healthy diet is expensive and I'm not saying it's it's not expensive but it doesn't have to be as expensive as we think it is because there are means and ways of um finding finding foods that are more reasonable and enabled and you can still include them in your diet and then obviously having sort of things like beans and pulses and and then lean choices of protein so a healthy diet is very much i think that picture that we still probably get taught at school um but the difference is that it's going to be it's going to the amounts you have will vary depending on what you're doing so if you're somebody that is fairly sedentary um 
doesn't you know doesn't do a lot maybe maybe does it like one or two exercise classes a, a week just to get, stay fit and healthy then you know you're going to want to keep the balance more on focus on fruits and vegetables protein and still have carbohydrates but it might be that you're not needing quite as much and you need to be a bit more mindful of perhaps some of the non-nutrient dense foods that we might include from time to time and that's not saying you shouldn't include them but it's just from time to time but I guess the more physically active you become the more you have to consider what your body needs in that moment so you know like a diet a performance diet is a little bit different from a healthy diet healthy eating diet in the sense that a performance diet is focusing on fueling and recovery and so sometimes the timing of what you eat and the choice of what you eat around your training are really important so making sure you've got that carbohydrate availability which we know is really key not only to give you energy but again what people don't realize is that the carbohydrate is also important for our bone health and it's also important for um, regulating our hormones and those are the hormones that you want in terms of getting the adaptation from your training as well so skimping on things like carbohydrate when you're physically very active often leads to um, more problems than it does good good outcomes I mean I'm not saying that you know we need to eat piles and piles of pasta but it is making sure that you do include it and again it's that timing and, and the portion sizes but again similarly like having protein we know that protein is really important in the response to exercise you know it's not necessarily that great from a fueling point of view but latest research has shown us that actually if you pulse your protein throughout the day that seems to have better outcomes than trying to have like this massive amount of protein just in recovery so kind of that pulsing of um, protein is really really key and then there might be other nutrients that you need to pay a bit more attention to so for example runners particularly should pay attention to iron because we know that when we certain types of foot strike and it's probably more your area Jen than mine but certain types of foot strike you know can break down more red blood cells and we we can see that but also things like vitamin d are really important not just from a bone health point of view but from an immune health point of view and also from a muscular recovery point of view so there's probably more nutrients you need to pay special attention to when you're physically active not saying that you shouldn't if you're just kind of if you're not physically active but you just need them in higher amounts so you need to be more mindful of that so I guess the real difference between a sort of healthy eating diet and a performance diet is that it's probably a little bit more targeted. It's probably a little bit more tailored um, and probably needs to be a bit more yeah, focused on what you're doing and also what your outcome is. You know, what is your goal? Is your goal to complete a big training block so you can finish a race or is your goal body composition or is your goal strength or is it power? And, and that, again, is going to play a part in how you eat and what you should eat. Brilliant, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I didn't mention at the beginning your own running achievement. So Rini has recently been crowned British trail running champion for about 45 category. Yeah. <laughs> <So> congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It yeah. pays off to be old, I've decided. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wearing your black trail runners vest as well. So cool. Just brilliant. Love that. Thank um, you. So yeah, Rini does a lot of running as well. So I wanted to kind of ask like with with that in mind that you've just said about timing and and things like what's your kind of go-to um maybe night before if you've got a big race coming up maybe a longer race um so you're doing the spine sprint in the summer aren't you which yeah. is 50 miles is that right yeah 46, 46 <laughs> miles. so coming up to that I was just wondering what your go-to kind of uh, the day before then like pre post and during race kind of strategy might might look like a bit so I tend to actually think about it a few days out from just the day before just because we know I know it takes sort of between 48 and 72 hours to get those full glycogen stores so I'll probably be thinking that I think so the sprint is on I say the sprint but you know what I mean that the right the race is on Saturday um when you call a race a sprint and it's 46 miles you know that you're in like definitely ultra running world but um yeah so it's on Saturday so I'll probably start thinking about my nutrition Wednesday if I'm honest and I won't change a huge amount as such in the sense that I think people assume that you need to go into this massive carb loading and that you have to eat piles and piles of food and that's not really what carb loading is you know carb loading is more about creating those glycogen stores and we know that doing that little and often over the course of several days and staying hydrated encourages better glycogen storage so 
Um, so I'll probably just make a few swaps. So for example, if I normally, I'm trying to think, I do eat quite carb heavy meals anyway, but if I would, let's say for a snack, I might normally, I might have some nuts. Well, actually instead of nuts, I'll always make sure I have something like a crumpet or um, some fruit loaf or um, a cereal bar or some oat cakes and some peanut butter. I always try and make sure that everything's a bit more carb dominant. And if I'm having pasta, rather than having um, like a, a protein heavy sauce I probably have like a more of a tomato based sauce with some vegetables and then a bit of cheese so that I can just get a bit more pasta in there rather than sort of filling up on loads of protein so I'd think about that a few days out but the day before my race I always try and have my main meal at lunchtime um, and then tend to eat a little bit lighter in the evening just because I've found that works best for me I'm not saying you should all do that but it just it works best for me because I don't I get quite anxious before races and um so I think for me, knowing that I've fully digested and I've got everything and then the evening I don't have to panic about the fact that I haven't eaten enough, I've sort of done it all. Um, so again, it does, I have to admit, my pre-race is always pasta. It was pasta before the uh, the race the other, the, other, other, the other day as well. So um, it's always pasta. Um, but to be fair, like I haven't, I do find I can eat potatoes and I can also eat rice. So if, so if you're somewhere away where you can't have, um, you can't have, you can't get what you normally have, then I, you know, I will make do <laughs> to, to be fair. So, um, and then the morning of is generally always a bagel. Um, and I usually will have half with Marmite and half with peanut butter. Um, that kind of is my go-to and always have coffee without fail, always black coffee. Um, and then during the race, well, I haven't done a 46 mile race for a very long time. So I've got a lot of practice to do, but I suppose my last race was, well, apart from the one, the, the half a few weeks ago, but my last big race was UTS last summer, which was well, last autumn, which is 50K. And I used a real mix of um, drinks, gels, real food, cheese and pickle sandwiches always go down a treat like at some point in the middle of a race um so I, I guess the thing is I do practice though I practice a lot in my long runs like I went for a long run at the weekend and I did you know I, I've started thinking right what am I going to take what do I want to try so that I know that I can I still want it at mile 20 or whatever because you know that's the thing as you get more tired and more fatigued you just don't always fancy what you've got so I think always having a variety helps um and I think that's the great thing about these longer races because you get aid stations and there's lots of there's lots of things that are available but I think again if you've tried everything beforehand you know that you're okay with eating crisps or you're okay with drinking flat coke or whatever it might be that you decide you're going to try that day um <laughs> UTS I'd never eaten a chocolate biscuit before in a race I mean I've eaten lots of chocolate biscuits but not in a race but it's funny I got to the second aid station and there was like these chocolate digestives and I was like oh I really fancy those and so I just like took a load and then I was munching my way and they were fine like everything was fine although I did need a bit more liquid than I'd taken on board I did get a bit, bit of heartburn because I hadn't drunk enough so I guess my strategy during the race is I try and start early so I'll probably start start fueling within the first half an hour. And that's really important um, because I know that I'm gonna run out of stores quite quickly if I'm not careful, um, especially because in the beginning as well, you get a bit carried away, don't you? You tend to go off a bit too fast. And, and then I hear my coach's voice going, slow down, <laughs> and then I slow down. But, um, but yeah, so um, I'll start, at, yeah, about 30 minutes in and I'll probably try and take on, I've been practicing with about 60 to 90 grams of carbs an hour. And I'm now at a point where I can manage that. Like a few years ago, I was like, it was really difficult and I couldn't do it, but now I can. So that's that's really good. Again, it's definitely made a difference in, in the fact that I can maintain my pace for a lot longer. Um, and I think just knowing that I can take that amount of energy on has really, really helped. And I, what I find is as I get more tired, I just have to, I have to just um, use drinks a lot more but I still can get that same amount of energy in, but I just, I just rely on drinks a bit more because I find eating harder. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my race strategy. And then post-race, I mean, I have been known to kind of get across the line and have a beer, um, but I don't think that's a bad thing when you know you're gonna <laughs> not be running for a bit. So I tend to have a beer and then, um, and then it's whatever, <laughs> to be honest. I don't think I have a, 
I don't, it's whatever I fancy. I don't know, sometimes I don't really feel like eating very much after the race. I always do eat something, but it's usually the days after that I'm absolutely starving and just need to make up for everything I've missed. But I suppose my, I do like chips after a race. I always find that I need chips. Like I think salt and vinegar is kind of probably what my body's been missing. So yeah, not probably what you're expecting to hear from a dietitian, but that's kind of beer and chips. <laughs> it's my, my recovery. <laughs> well, so what I was going to ask, um, I mean, my next question was going to be like, what's your advice for someone doing their first ultra run, my like ultra marathon? Um, but I think you kind of covered it all there, really. I think, is there anything else you'd add if it was someone who'd never done an ultra before? Um, maybe 50 miles. Um, like, is there anything else you'd add for like, how to maybe how to work out I think you were kind of referring to gut training mm, with, yeah with, so how long has it taken you to kind of work up to that like, I guess it... I guess it's taken me a couple of I say that so I used to do road marathons back in the day that's kind of what I started off doing and I always found gels quite difficult to stomach um but I think it's because I just didn't do I was one of those you know people who for whatever reason just decided that you didn't need to actually do it in the training you just did it on the race day which of course is not how you do it um so I suppose over the last couple of years I suppose since I started doing the longer distance stuff um and particularly when I've done the mountain races you have to eat because you just you have to keep on top of it and so I suppose those all those situations have really helped but yeah you definitely need to get your gut training and and also be mindful that the conditions can also affect it. Like if I'm dehydrated, even a gel that I could normally tolerate, I won't be able to tolerate. So making sure you understand that aspect of it. And the other mistake a lot of people make is when you do take gels, people tend to take the whole gel in one go. And actually, if you just take it little by little over the course of sort of sort of five to seven minutes, it's much better tolerated. So it's almost like a bit of a slower, whereas if you just put a big shot of glucose into your <laughs> into your bloodstream into your stomach and and there's no remember there's no blood flow going to your stomach at that point it is going to not really be tolerated that well so taking it on slowly can be really useful um but i suppose one of the big bits of advice i'd give someone who's new to ultra running is um try and practice at the pace you also think you might be running at which is quite difficult difficult when you're doing ultra running because it's constantly changing and the terrain is constantly changing but if you have a rough idea then it's worth because again if you're running harder you might find it more difficult to eat solid food and you might have to focus more on drinks um and if you're you know but if you're actually doing a terrain like uts you you couldn't run a lot of it a lot of it was climbing if i'm honest a lot of it was scrambling climbing um there's lots of boulders and, and you were jumping over things it was it was you know so you didn't actually get into a rhythm of running so eating wasn't that difficult and then when i've done mountain races I realized that I couldn't eat when I was going uphill because I had poles as so if you've got poles in your hand then you can't eat because you need your poles and so learning at that point okay I need to take uh, fuel in so that's when I learned to sort of use the drinks rather than focusing on food and I suppose the more you do the more you realize what what works and what doesn't but yeah I'd say practice running over different terrains make sure that you find the things that work for you at those on those trains but the other thing is always make sure you've got something you look forward to like it's it's really important because as you know when you you know you're you've done lots of ultras as well you get to a point where you're always going to have a bit of a low spot you're always going to have a point where you think why am I doing this to myself and if you've got something to look forward to other than seeing your family and friends and children and whatever else but if you've got something that you really look forward to eating it can almost be like a a bit of a motivator so I did a race in the peaks two years ago and when I got to 40K, I was like, now I'm going to have my Snickers bar. And it was like something I really looked forward to. And so it kind of then just gave me a real buzz and I could do the last 10K without worrying, to, or without, without feeling too, too tired because I'd kind of given myself that something to look forward to. So those sorts of things are quite useful as well. That's really good. <clears throat> good advice as well. Yeah, I, I have mini cheddars and banana milkshake, I think, because... <laughs> I know we'll always hit the spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think you get to a point where you definitely want something salty, don't you? And then that's like, okay, I need like potatoes are quite good as well. Like salted yeah. potatoes are quite good. Um, and I quite like a ginger beer. 
you know like it's quite hard to get hold of <laughs> we're quite like a ginger beer like 20 miles in but you know yeah it's probably quite good for settling your stomach as well isn't it the ginger yeah. And, yeah yeah cool yeah um yeah i was going to ask about like you mentioned gels and getting used to them um and like we're constantly bombarded by all the sports nutrition products and there are so many out there and and it can be quite hard to know whether like are they essential and what like what do we want to go for and what do we want to maybe avoid when it comes to sports nutrition stuff um and yeah to what extent do we have to like train with them with with what we're going to use on race day and like what's your kind of take on on the whole sports nutrition market i think it is saturated right now and everybody like with everything else everything's everybody's competing with everybody and i always say still go back to the basics and keep it simple um so like for example if we if we think about protein protein powders like they're massive at the moment everybody's like using recovery powders or protein powders and, and when you start looking at what a protein powder is fundamentally it is skim milk powder uh, usually with you know a few preservatives and some sweeteners added in so this is why i kind of I'm still a big fan of using flavored milk as recovery rather than worrying about protein powders also they can be more convenient especially if you know you're out and about or you're traveling to your races or you know you you're running to work and you don't have the opportunity to to get something that you can use them so i'm not saying you shouldn't use protein powders but i always say if you're going to just get something really really simple like just pure whey and you don't need all the one with all the frills on it and i'd say it's probably the same for gels i mean i guess people always ask do we need to take gels do we need that glucose hit and the answer is you probably do particularly if you are doing more higher intensity running so if you're doing like a marathon a road race a road marathon or even even on ultras and we've had this conversation before you're not really at any you're not at a sort of one pace are you constantly changing you're going up a hill you're still working at an effort it might not be the pace but you're still working at a high effort and the harder you're working actually your body relies on carbohydrate a lot more and glucose being that much more easily digestible form of carbohydrate that your body can take on and utilize straight away so yes there is benefit to eating real food in the sense that it's nice to eat real food and i think it's something to look forward to and and definitely gives you that um satisfaction but sometimes actually glucose is better because it's the thing that's more easily digested and tolerated by the body and so knowing that and being able to have some of those things you know as a backup can be useful like if you can't take anything else so i'm not saying you know like i in the past i probably wouldn't have used um gels that often until the end of a race but more recently i've i have found a brand that i really like and actually they tend to make their gels mainly from fruit so i quite like the sort of um i like the, the taste they're not they're not sickly they're kind of more fresh rather than um sort of sickly sweet so i found something that works for me but again i'd always say it's about finding what works for you but from a physiological point of view and a scientific point of view there will be times when actually sugar is what you need now whether that's jelly babies or whether that's a gel that's entirely up to you i can't chew and run I've worked that one out so hence I don't I try not to do that but some people can and it's not a problem um so you know I think it does depend on the terrain the race and also the conditions too um you know I think if it's very very hot that can have an effect on what you can tolerate too um you know that the, the hotter it is again the higher your core temperature is going to go the harder your body's going to be working so actually you're using glucose a lot quicker so you might find that you need to take on more carbohydrate but actually taking on with a drink is a better way because then you get the hydration and the electrolytes at the same time so i think it's about sort of being mindful of i always say whenever i work with anybody um whether it's a runner, whether it's an Ironman, or whether it's a cyclist, when you're thinking about your, your race, let's, let's look at what's going to be there. Let's look at the course. Let's look at the potential um, what ifs, you know, what if it's raining? What if it's windy? What if it's really warm? What, you know, so that you've, you've thought about everything before you go into that race and you've almost tried every potential situation out so you can feel confident because at the end of the day we can only control so much on race day but if we can control those elements knowing that we are as prepared as we possibly can be it just takes something else off your list of things to do and it's kind of 
yeah, like I said, it's kind of what I do with all the people I work with as well. Cool, brilliant. Um, I think it'd be good to uh, move on to your forthcoming book now because I'd really like to talk about some more specific diets and like the whole vegan plant-based craze. Um, and also we've had a really nice uh, question from Laura um, about eating disorders and that's something I think it'd be really good to come on to with, with your expertise in, in um, rare deaths and, and eating disorders as well. So I think if we move on to your book and then kind of look at the, um, at the, the specific diets it covers and things. So the book is More Fuel You um, and do you want to tell us a bit about it? Yes, so the book is more for you. And before I say any more about the book, just to say that Jen had quite a lot to do with this book. She has basically helped me edit it and uh, has done a brilliant job. So without Jen, this book would have been written because I would still be aimlessly writing and getting down, going down rabbit holes. But you really helped me to structure it. So um, I really enjoy so being part of it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, more for you. Well, I wanted to, so Vertebrate approached me and they wanted to write a book that basically provided all the information that a runner, cyclist, climber, anybody, basically adventurer could have in one place. Because as we said right at the beginning, there's so much information out there and there's hard to sieve through all that information and know what's right and what works for you. And I think fundamentally, the whole point of More Fuel You is for you to work out what works for you. It is a book that goes through you know, the physiology, it goes through energy requirements, it goes through how the body works, including the psychology of like why we choose food and our behavior around food. It's, it's a book about, I suppose, self-awareness more than anything else. And the idea is not to say you shouldn't do this or you should do that. The idea is to say, here's all the information. And, you know, if you choose to go down this path, then that's great, but make sure if you do, these are some of the things that you might need to look out for that may be problematic. So it's never it's never going to be about telling people they should or shouldn't do anything, because I think there's too much of that in the in the nutrition world. And we are all unique and our physiology is unique. And I think we spend too much time comparing ourselves to other people and trying to be like everybody else. And I just wanted people to choose the right fit for them and have the confidence to choose the right fit for them. So. So the book's in two parts, and the first part of the book is very much around um, the, the different diets that a lot of athletes, I suppose, are following, and then the kind of science behind it, and what the, what the science says, and then what the actual science is saying, and, and, and the place it plays. And then the second part of the book was to sort of put a spotlight on populations that um, are often overlooked in the sports 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 science world I would say full stop um, so we've looked specifically at female athletes and gone through um, pretty much the whole lifespan in going up to sort of perimenopause and menopause we looked at the older athlete so <laughs> believe it or not anybody over 35 is counted as being older but we've kind of focused a little bit more on sort of people in their you know 45 and over um, and then we've looked at the individual athlete, which are those athletes that may, you know, may be trying to train with chronic illnesses or disabilities um, or come from a different background. They might minority group background and how that feels for them, particularly if they're trying to fit a certain mold, um, you know, within within modern society. So I hope people will like it because it's a it's a real I think it takes you on a journey and I'm really proud of it. Um, and I hope Jen, you're proud of it too. But I'm really, really proud of it, and I'm I'm excited to see what people think about it. It's a bit like your new book. It's a little bit different to what I've done before, and there is a little bit of me in there. Um, you know, I have talked a little bit about my own experiences and and my relationship with food a little bit as well. So people get to get to know me a bit better as well. But um, yeah, I'm excited to see what people think. <laughs> Brilliant. And that's out in June from Vertebrate. Out in it? June, but it's out for pre-order on the 5th of April, I believe. So Ooh, excellent. So we'll keep an eye out for it. Excellent. So in that book, you deal with with like you go through some of the different diets that are popular at the moment that people might choose to try for perhaps health reasons, perhaps ethical reasons. Like people have all sorts of reasons for choosing a different diet. But it'd be quite good to look at a couple of those. So if we start with kind of vegan plant-based diets, which are really popular at the moment, and 
like people choose them for animal welfare, ethical reasons. Um, so if if somebody wanted to go vegan and was training hard as well, um, like what are the kind of pros and cons of vegan diets and, and what do we need to be really careful of? Like, are we are we going to be missing out things from, from not having meat and dairy, that kind of thing? So, yeah, so as you said, vegan diets are very, very popular. And, and to be fair, there's no reason why you can't follow a vegan diet if you are very active, but you do need to pay a little bit more attention, I would say. Um, so on the one hand, vegan diets can be really, really good in the sense that because they do tend to be naturally a little bit higher in carbohydrate because you're having more beans and pulses. And obviously to make sure you get the right mix of um, all the amino acids, you need to combine your grains and your beans on a, you know, throughout the day to make sure you get all the amino acids. So vegan diets can be slightly higher in carbohydrate and that has been shown to be actually quite useful, particularly in endurance runners, because um, they're not getting, it's not getting displaced. The carbohydrate is not getting displaced by big, big pieces of protein and um, which can often make you feel quite full. So there are benefits from that point of view. However, on the same, on the same sort of spectrum of that, vegan diets do tend to be quite fibrous. So they will have much more um, fiber and they're probably quite voluminous. So it can be quite hard to get the energy that you need, um, but also can be, you know, cannot always be as gut friendly as you hope it to be, particularly if you're doing a lot of um, physical activity. And again, it's something you need to build in slowly and your, your gut will eventually adapt and, and you will get used to it, but it does take time um, and everybody's gut's going to adapt differently because again, it's going to be very much based on what your your maternal nutrition was and what you were when you were growing up and, and all these different things. So, so I think um, there's, like I said, there's no reason why you can't have plant-based diets at all uh, for, for physical activity, but just need to be mindful that they might be low in energy, albeit higher in carbohydrate. Um, and they may be a bit more difficult to digest um, and get enough in. Equally, you might find that in some cases, protein can be hard to, to get as well, even though we were sort of talking about this kind of combination of beans and grains. But again, it might still be limited. And, you know, you may need to start supplementing with things like pea protein um, or soya protein just to kind of give you that, that extra bit of protein. Um, there are certain nutrients that are problematic in vegan diets in that they're not available at all. So B12 being one of them. So you definitely need to supplement with B12. And often I'd be mindful of iron as well, just because the iron that's available in plant-based foods um, is quite difficult to absorb. So it can be just harder. It's not that you're not taking enough in, it just can be quite difficult to absorb because of um, different sort of phytates and oxalates um, that bind it, that are, bind, that, that are bound in the, in the vegetables. So that can make it a little bit more difficult. Um, but on the whole, if you want to want to do it it is possible but you just need to be mindful of those aspects of it really more than anything else cool thank you and like when you look at the really good ultra runners there seems to be such a range like people like scott durek and and damien who's your your coach obviously hugely successful on a vegan diet and then you look at courtney de water who eats pretty much anything as long as it's nachos I think <laughs> yeah, yeah so it's really interesting looking at there doesn't seem to be a one-size-fits-all for, for anyone really and that's it's good in a way um yeah definitely yeah and um, one another another diet you've looked at is a low-carb diet um and you've had an interesting chat with with <laughs> Professor Tim Noakes about this one which was brilliant <laughs> um but yes yeah, so I'd, I'd quite like to kind of hear some of your thoughts on that and whether I think that possibly that's slightly less less popular nowadays. I'm not sure if it's dropped in popularity a little bit, but it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts about low carbohydrate diets for runners and uh, like for for endurance athletes anyway. Yeah, no, definitely. I think I think you're right. the the pop The popularity of low carb diets has definitely decreased in the athletic world. I think, unfortunately there is still quite a lot of fear mongering about carbohydrates in the fitness world. So I think there's, there's definitely aspects um, and people associate uh, certain body compositions with higher protein diets and, um, and not with carbohydrates. So 
but you're right it's, there's definitely a, I think people especially in the athletic world because so many new papers have come out um you know Louise Burke has done several papers in the last few years um that has shown that it can actually longer term it can actually have a negative effect on your performance and on your economy particularly so I think more and more athletes are kind of like oh I don't want that and and sort of you know trying to trying to change it and we've also seen there was a there was a good review um like a, a sort of meta-analysis of all the papers out there by um I can't remember his first name but it's it's Marta is his second name and um you know he looked at this whole sort of training low effect that we've heard so much about and that's kind of where this low carb diet has kind of come from in the sense that in the cycling world they talk a lot about training training low where you do do your training in a carb depleted state um but it, this very quickly got mistranslated to meaning that you just didn't eat carbs and actually when you look at what training low really is yes you do one or two sessions in this carb depleted state but as soon as you finish that session, you are back on eating your carbohydrate and you're having the amount of carbohydrate you need for the rest of the day for that amount of training that you've done. So it's not it's not about not eating carbs. It was about periodizing your carbs. And again, Louise Burke has spoken a lot about this in her most recent paper, in, which is I think 2020, um, looking at periodization of carbs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Professor Noakes and I had quite an interesting conversation um, and it was it's been interesting the feedback from that that podcast because I've had lots of people telling me that you know I did a really good job and stayed calm and cool and um and he was he was an interesting character um and you know he's he is highly regarded and he's done lots of really good things that we're I'm not going to kind of take away from um but I think the problem is that we were talking about quite different population groups you know he's talking about a very sedentary overweight population whereas we are talking about here an athletic physically active population and you know the science is pretty clear that really if you are physically active you definitely need carbohydrate not just for fueling the muscles but also for like we talked about the hormonal cascade that you need for recovery for bone health for um, adaptation as well so there's definitely a, a need for carbohydrate and, and I've seen it a lot in our clinic as well, where um, particularly when we've had female athletes coming in with who are struggling with things like hypothalamic amenorrhea, so where their periods have stopped, that, you know, again, carbohydrate availability is the key thing that seems to be one of the limiting factors in um, kind of that hormone, hormonal regulation. So it's not a diet that I tend to recommend professionally. Um, but equally, as we, you know, we've we've uh, we've discussed in the book, there will be times and places where it may be relevant and it may be useful to use. Um, but we should always be mindful and look out for potential red flags that could be problematic. And females in particular are much more sensitive to low energy availability and low carbohydrate avail availability because we, you know, our bodies are designed to reproduce. And so actually we we tolerate a lot less in terms of restriction, whereas males do tend to get away with it for a bit longer. Um, and so actually when by the time they may present with some of the some of the pitfalls of going on a low carb diet, it's two, it's even it might be two, three years down the line. And that's one of the things that we we found in, in when we were doing the research for the book was that a lot of the papers didn't actually even go that far. You know, they'd look at something over 12 weeks, or they'd look at something up to two years was the longest, was the longest study I found. And actually it'd be great to do like longitudinal studies on five years or 10 years and find out what's going on. But that's always the case with, with science. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think it'd be quite good to move on to, like we've sort of got to this point now of, of when, when dieting goes, that, that your diet doesn't, doesn't provide the, the energy or nutrient requirements. Um, I'm just going to read Laura's um, uh, question. Hi, Winnie. I was diagnosed with anorexia at age 39 after working a personal trainer who had me on a very low calorie diet, even though I'm, uh, I'm an ultra runner. Um, I am now under eating disorder service in the NHS trying to recover. Uh, I worry that a normal weight will prevent me from achieving the level I've been. So thank you, Laura. That's a, a really um, brilliant question. And I think this will kind of go nicely into um, Red S and um, 
you know, why why we find ourselves in in this position where we we're not fueling sufficiently in order to achieve performance goals um, and how that all all works. Yeah, and thank you, Laura, and thank you also for being so um, open and honest because it's not always easy to to talk about um, your own sort of um, issues and concerns. So it's really good that you brought it up, and I'll try and answer the question alongside kind of being a bit general as well. But so I think eating disorders are quite complex, and when we look at Red S, which is relative energy deficiency in sport. Um, it's on a continuum. And so you can have what we call accidental red S where you basically just don't appreciate how much fuel you should be eating um, for the work you're doing. And then that can move through to something that you consciously end up doing. But equally like Laura's case, it might be that you started off accidental because somebody has told you to eat less and then the the chronic under fueling and the chronic under eating does affect how our brains work. They change, it actually changes the structure of our brains and affects how our sort of thought processes work and then can lead to much more kind of serious eating disorders. So it's important to kind of say there is this kind of continuum and not everybody that has accidental redness is gonna end up with an eating disorder um, and equally an eating disorder does need to be um, managed maybe slightly differently to how accidental red S would be just because of the, 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 the complex nature of, of what an eating disorder is. And, and I think, you know, again, an eating disorder is not, it's not a diet that's necessarily gone wrong. And it's not about, it's not really even about food and body image. It's actually about something a lot more deep rooted in the sense that it's, it's the, the, the food and the exercise and the training is the medium by which the person is projecting onto. So, you know, we know that humans um, are hardwired to not really want to experience pain or rejection or discomfort or abandonment or any of these like, negative uh, parts of our lives. Um, and what happens is that it's not a conscious decision, but we find methods, behaviors that help us to avoid it. And while there are temporary fix, in that they help us temporarily feel better, the more we do them, they become a learnt behaviour. And then this learnt behaviour ends up being something much more problematic because it can then start having severe consequences to your mental and physical health. So it's it's a lot more complicated. And I guess to answer Laura's question around being fearful that being a normal weight or a restored weight, shall we call it, because I think that's much more important. Something I do notice in eating disorder services, they talk a lot about weight gain, but actually what we're trying to do is support someone to get back to a restored weight where your body actually works optimally for you. And that's really important to hold on to, Laura, because at the moment, being a lightweight, while it might feel safe, might it might give you this false sense of security, that it's, it's the right place to be, your body's not functioning for you and it's not working for you. So you can't actually get the results you're looking for. And that's what a lot of people don't realize or appreciate um, because they, they get stuck, especially when you initially lose a little bit of weight. Often many of us will see a slight improvement in our performance, but what we don't realize is that there's a, there's a place where it stops. And actually sometimes if we've gone beyond that place, it's not sustainable and the body can no longer continue to support what it needs to do. Um, and so you end up not, you know, you end up actually seeing a deterioration and then, a, you know, kind of well, actually stagnation first and then a deterioration. And then you often get crippled with um, injuries and, and potential bone stresses and, and all sorts of different things. So I think to answer your question, Jen, why are we seeing this more and more? I think, unfortunately, we do live in a society where there's so much mixed messaging around activity and food and I feel like we really are a very image conscious society and there's lots of body ideals out there I'm not saying that these are things that cause us to go down that route but they start to infiltrate and inform us inform us and create a narrative in our head you know that the more time we spend looking at images that are not helpful the more they 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 impact how we think and so that then becomes 
almost our our reality well I'll only be good enough if because we see that when somebody is a certain way they get lots of attention and they get lots of approval and they're seen as being successful and so that starts to fill our brains with well if I do that then I'll also be successful if I lose a few kilos I'll be faster you know it kind of goes down that that sort of mindset so unfortunately I think that is often the contributor starting point but often we have we have to remember that particularly with eating disorders they are genetic disorders in the sense that they you are generally genetically predisposed pre sorry start again you're genetically susceptible to developing an eating disorder I'm not saying you will but you are genetically susceptible and when you put the right psychosocial environment in that place so when you do put someone into a potentially competitive environment into an environment where maybe that person is constantly find themselves comparing and looking at ideals then that can set up that sort of pathway to develop these dysfunctional thoughts and then dysfunctional behaviors that go alongside them well thank you and thanks again laura um yeah just uh, if anyone else has any questions please do put them in the chat and um, we'll be wrapping up fairly soon but we've got got time for a few questions um just on the red s side of things whether it's um kind of a, an incidental um, development or it's something that has happened through um, through intentional um, restriction what's the um, what's the process by which that happens and what are the the red flags we might look for with with red s so what happens with red s is basically there's not enough energy in the system to allow for biological function and the work that you're asking your body to do so when we talk about the work the body's doing it is kind of all movement is included in that so that's also just like um you're commuting you're walking you're up and down the stairs as well as your training so actually that's quite an energy it's quite an energetic process you know we use a lot more energy than we think we do when we're running around walking all the time commuting etc so if you haven't got enough energy in the system to support that and biological function the body will always prioritize movement because it always has done so it starts to then down regulate biological processes um, a bit like when your smartphone's on low battery and it starts to sort of switch off sort of apps that are not important that's what it will start to do with the human body as well and so that's why sometimes things like um, menstrual function are the, often the first ones to go in women because, or, or become affected. It doesn't necessarily have to go, they can just become affected and that you might notice that they're a bit lighter or you might notice that they, they change in frequency um, or they become a bit more erratic. And then yes, they may well stop completely. And that's because the body is not, is, is, hasn't got enough energy. So it'd be a hostile environment for that female to fall pregnant. And so that's not gonna happen basically. But other things that get affected are your digestive system. So often in our clinic, what we find is that a lot of people come in and they've got these, these digestive disorders that they think are IBS, but actually they are what we call gastroparesis where the sort of movement of food through the gut is so slow that it starts to ferment and create a lot of discomfort and bloating and does feel a lot like IBS, but it's not. And the problem with that is that obviously the standard treatment for IBS is, is an exclusion diet. And if you're already not eating enough and then you go on an exclusion diet, you make the whole thing worse. So there's, there's elements of, of digestion. It can also affect um, our immune system. So often we see this on, on um, blood tests. So Di uh, reds is diagnosed by exclusion so you have to we tend to do a lot of blood tests to see make sure that there's nothing else going on it's not something medical that we're missing um but one of the things that you often see is that your white cell count can be a bit low um and that's indicated there's just not enough energy to support good immune health we know it affects bone health generally because hormones are down regulated so if testosterone and estrogen are down regulated then that's going to affect your bone health particularly um, but it can also start to affect other things because both testosterone and estrogen are really important in our cognitive function and also in our mood. So we know that they're both what we call serotonin uptake receptors. So they take serotonin into the brain and makes us feel good. But if we have low levels of estrogen and testosterone, then that will also start to decline. So that can also be um, problematic. And then you do often notice an increase in sort of tendon and ligament um, uh, injuries as well. Um, and as we said before, the um, 
you find that performance might improve slightly to begin with, then it stagnates and then it deteriorates. The other thing that you might notice is that actually body composition doesn't change so much. So you don't necessarily have to lose weight with red S, which is what is often one of the most confusing things because people will say to me, well, if I'm not eating enough, surely I'd lose weight. And again, we've, we've learned this kind of calories in, calories out thing because it's been simplified um, on social media, but actually the body is a lot more complicated than that. And if you are physically very active, it's going to do as much as it can to preserve energy to prevent you from, from actually being in that vulnerable state. So actually you tend to hold on to more body fat and your metabolic rate reduces right down to try and keep as much energy in as possible. So you don't always lose weight and you often, you can find that you hold on to more um, body fat, particularly around your abdomen as well. So a lot of people will notice that as well. So there's quite a lot of symptoms. It, some of the sort of symptoms you might notice kind of, if you, you know, if you're not being checked out by a doctor and stuff is that you're just not recovering very well between training sessions. Um, you are getting more injured. You're finding that even your motivation to train is, is quite low and you feel like you have to do it rather than you want to do it. That's a big, that's a big one. Like a lot of people feel they have to do it. It's almost like a tick box rather than I actually really want to go out and get some sunshine or be in the outdoors or, or whatever it might be. Um, and yet you're quite tired generally. You probably feel quite fatigued as well. So there's a, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of sort of red flags to keep an eye out for. Cool, thank you. That's, that's brilliant. Um, we've just had a um, question from Lauren. Hi, Irene and Jen. Thanks for the amazing talk. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in what the brand of gels are that you mentioned earlier, please, really. <laughs> Big shout out for Velo Forte. <laughs> yes, sorry. Yeah, I love, I do love Velo Forte. I think because they tend to um, base all their products as much as possible on fruit and veg um, and sort of they put a lot of ginger in things. As I said, I'm a big fan of ginger. So um, I think that's why I like them. They do these really nice um, chews as well. Like they look like Turkish Delight, but they're not. They're sort of... Um, They've got like orange, lemon, and cherry flavored ones, which are really. Do they taste a little bit like Turkish delight? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I do like them, so they're they're quite good as well. Yeah, seconded. They we like them as well. <laughs> yeah, and we'll put links to Beanie's book and Fairly Forty and anything else we've mentioned and my book in the um in the chat and on an email as well. So, um, if there aren't any more questions, um, and Rini, if there's anything else you'd like to add at this point but otherwise um I think we'll wrap up anything yeah, yeah. Oh, Anna, Anna about <laughs>